Uh, I am the MC of the day. Also, on behalf of the Policy and Area Studies Research Unit, Kulia of Islamic Review Knowledge and Human Sciences, we would like to thank you for your attendance and participation for today's webinar title, Islam, Democracy and Populism. So let's begin our program today with the recitation of Al-Fatiha. The Muslim world from Egypt to Malaysia is facing crisis to determining the best form of governance. Uh, populism becomes one of the features of Muslim democracies, leading to the question of whether political Islam lead to populism and whether Islamic populism can lead to democratization or become obstacle to democratic transition in the Muslim world. So to, uh, to answer all these questions, we have five distinguished panelists with us this morning. I will pass the floor to the policy and area study. I'm sorry, uh, policy and area studies research unit, uh, supposedly to be Dr. Abdi. So he's having uh, some technical issues. So I'm passing the floor to Dr. Rabia to begin the session. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so basically, um, it's supposed to be Dr. Afdi. He has prepared uh, so much uh, for this particular session, but uh, he has some uh, technical uh, issues right now. So um, while he is working on his technical issues, perhaps um, I will take over for a while. And let's see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of our panelists, our very distinguished panelists, um, uh, who have been uh, grace gracefully uh, agreed uh, for this session. Um, so um, before uh, we begin, I would like to explain a bit of the house rules. So basically, each panelist will have nine minutes, and audience uh, should write their questions into the chat box. And then later we will select the uh, questions to be answered by the panelists. So a reminder that all this is an academic discussion. It is a, 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 a so the discussion should be uh, uh, academic based, right? Um, and also um, I think we can apply Chatham House rules um, for this particular session. This session is uh, recorded, right? Um, so if you feel uncomfortable uh, with the recording, uh, feel free to uh, leave the session. Uh, so um, before we begin, I would like to introduce the panelists uh, to the audience. Uh, today, uh, we are very excited very much to have Professor Ihsan Yilmaz, who is a research professor and chair of Islamic studies and intercultural dialogue at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization, Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia. Um, one of his much cited book, Muslim Laws, Politics and Society in Modern Nation States, Dynamic Legal Pl Pluralism in England, Turkey and Pakistan has been a pathbreaker in the study of unofficial Islamic legal pluralism in secular nation states. So he has been actively using Twitter, uh, so you can follow him at Ehsan YLMS, right? Uh, and then we, uh, secondly, we have Mr. Hasnan Bahtiar, who is a lecturer at the Department of Sharia, Faculty of Islamic Studies, Universities of Muhammadiyah Malang, uh, Indonesia. He obtained his uh, majoring in Islamic legal theories from UMM, and then he pursued his advanced MA uh, in the specific field of law of war and international relations from the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies at the Australian National University. So um, he has vast um, experience as well, especially in relations to um, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And then we have our uh, Associate Professor, Dr. Muniru Zaman, um, who is also a lecturer at the Department of Political Science, IIUM. He is an active researcher. He published in repeated journals such as Commonwealth and Comparative Politics and South Asian Survey, right? Uh, apart from the academic writings, he also has his creative site where he has published 11 literary works in, in the form of novels, poetry, travelogue, and etc. Uh, and he was also the head of the Department of Political Science in uh, IIUM from 2012 to 2013. 
And then we have an upcoming researcher, Dr. Shaza Shukri, who is uh, also with the Department of Political Science. Uh, she is an active researcher um, on identity politics, populism, political Islam, and party politics. And uh, she's specialized in democratization and Middle Eastern politics. And last but not least, we have Dr. Kautar Gwedari, who is also an assistant professor at the Department of History and Civilization. And her research areas include Palestine, the modern Middle East, Zionism, and settler colonialism. Her areas of specialization include historical and civilizational studies, Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Levant, colonialism, modern history, Palestine, and the Middle East. So I think this is a very, um, we are very excited for this webinar, not only because of the topic, but also because it brings um, uh, scholars from uh, different areas of the world, as well as from different areas of specialization together. And we hope that we get to benefit from this particular discussion today. So uh, I'm afraid Dr. Afdi is still working on his, um, uh, his uh, technical issues, but perhaps we can uh, start first. Um, so uh, uh, we will uh, start the first round by uh, having our esteemed Professor Ehsan to uh, begin uh, the discussion. Um, so Professor Ehsan, uh, in general, uh, we know that populism challenges liberal democracies, uh, constitutions, institutions, rules and procedures in favor of empowered authority of leaders. So how far you think this can be justified from the Islamic perspective and how is it being used by political parties that grounded themselves on the religion of Islam, in particular the Muslim world, who intend to develop democracies and transit from uh, authoritarian rule. Uh, over to you, Prof. Ehsan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the question is very com uh, complicated because <laughs> they, there is no definition of Islam. Who is Islam first? There are many Islams, sociologically speaking, and there are many theological interpretations. Even within the Hanafi school or Shafi school, you would find many different uh, interpretations and on the other hand uh, populism is also a very complex uh, phenomenon there are many from the theoretical perspective there are many definitions there is no universally agreed definition and also there are many manifestations of it left-wing populism right-wing populism religious populism etc uh, but we have to make some generalizations of course so generally speaking, when we say populism, it means that first there is a ruler, an authority, a leader who claims to be representing the people. And in this sense, the people is defined as a monolithic entity, sometimes a homogeneous entity, and their will uh, is represent represented by this leader. And secondly, when we look at the populism literature, there is always some bad guys. It's like the Hollywood movies, a villain. Uh, it's sometimes the elite, and it depends who this elite is. Sometimes it is ethnic minorities, rich people, business people. Sometimes it is the bureaucratic elite. Sometimes it is military. Sometimes it is the political class, all of them. Uh, but at the end of the day, the leader claims that this elite is corrupt, evil, Sometimes they have international connections, uh, transnational connections, uh, and together with these transnational or international backers, they conspire against the people. And the conclusion of these leaders is that uh, only the leader can save the people against these existential threats uh, that want to eliminate the people uh, and replace it with something else or convert it to something else. And only the leader can do it so that the people must rally around this person. And when we look at the details, what we see is that the leaders sometimes claim that judiciary, media, even parliament, 
the usual institutions we see that they, they check the balance of the rulers in pluralist societies. It doesn't have to be liberal democracies. Uh, pluralist societies where there are human rights, where people's uh, for especially political rights are respected. You see that judiciary, even in medieval periods, sometimes judiciary played a role to check the power of the rulers in even in some Islamic empires so that they could object to the empires, emperors, they could question their authority. Sometimes they could tell them that you are wrong. You shouldn't do it. So the power and authority of the ruler were limited by these institutions. Sometimes ulama class, sometimes other bureaucratic structures. Uh, so the authoritarian populist leaders generally attack these institutions by claiming that these are these institutions are contaminated, they are polluted, they, there are some evil elite working in these institutions. So they have to be bypassed. And because there are existential threats, the leader doesn't have much time. He cannot wait for the parliament to discuss these issues. He cannot wait for public debate and discussion. He cannot wait for some informed uh, discussions in the media by the experts. He cannot even ex uh, trust the experts. They may be working for some foreign governments. Who, who knows? So what happens in the final analysis that the leader, if he finds enough power, if he convinces the people, and if there are not really powerful checks, sometimes it's the military, unfortunately, doesn't have to, it, it shouldn't play a political role, but in, in many situations, it plays a political role. It's sometimes bureaucracy, it's sometimes the elite class, sometimes the educated sections of society, sometimes international pressure, etc. But the leader, if he's not challenged or limited by these powers or institutions or groups, then he takes it to the extremes. So he bypasses the parliament, he monopolizes the media, either marginalizes them and frames them as enemies that shouldn't be trusted. He can even frame Muslim groups as some groups that are working from the for the United States or Mossad, whatever. If they are a little bit critical of the ruler. And when we look at populists, you see that generally they benefit from emotions, uh, resentment, humiliation, collective uh, psychological mood of the masses. They uh, make use of them. They benefit from conspiracy theories that can never be proven. Uh, so the leader always wins because the accused can never pro prove their innocence. Uh, so by using all these narratives, and especially if they, if they are in power, by also using the powerful or organs of the state, such as sometimes the judiciary, sometimes security forces, sometimes the state-controlled media, sometimes government tenders money, Buy, can buy anything. So by using all these, they generally gradually uh, marginalize these groups, institutions, opposition groups, any critical alim or journalist, etc. Let's look at this from Islamic perspective. I said that there are many Islams. That's the case. Look at Taliban. They are Hanafi. But then Muslims in Bosnia, they are Hanafi as well, but their understanding is, is, of Islam is diametrically opposite. When we look at the roots of the uh, problem, one of the uh, issues I can see that it is indeed rooted in the books, unfortunately, Islamic books. When you look at Fakh books, Islamic jurisprudence books, what Taliban says is actually in the books. Flogging the woman, having four wives, 
uh, beating up uh, women, your wives, if they are not obedient, uh, obeying the rulers, uh, sacredness of the state and authority, fear from anarchy so that you must obey the rulers, etc. Not much focus on the freedoms and opposition, critical voices, but too much focus on the worship and how you wash your feet, etc. But not much on corruption, uh, disobeying the authority when they are not lawful or legitimate. You cannot find much discussion on these issues. And the books, unfortunately, they are legally pluralist in the sense that there are all sorts of different opinions, sometimes contradicting opi opinions on the single issue. So what these rulers do when they find the opportunity, they pick and choose. That's why you have different interpretations. And unfortunately, Muslim educated classes and especially the alims, ulema, couldn't uh, progressively interpret Islam and these rules. They are still in the books. So if someone says his daily prayers, namaz, salah, daily, he should be beaten up. Look at four major Islamic schools. All of them say this. Homosexuals, same thing. They, they must be killed. Murtad. Some, some people who leave Islam. What happens to them? And you cannot actually rule cosmopolitan, pluralist, multicultural societies with these rules. And uh, so there are many Islams and populist leaders, unfortunately, generally prefer the authoritarian ones. The ones, the rules, norms, or interpretations that are against human rights. On the other hand, there are many interpretations. Uh, they look at pluralist aspect of Islam. Uh, Makasid al-Sharia, for instance, which is a human rights uh, understanding of Quran and Sharia that centers around the protection of human rights, protection of life, protection of intellect, protection of property, protection of family, etc. And there are many Muslim scholars who have been arguing that all Islamic jurisprudential understanding with regards to social society, with regards to politics, must be reinterpreted from the perspective of Makassid al-Sharia, from the perspective of human rights. But these people are in minority, unfortunately, even in Muslim majority societies. Nobody listens to them. They are labeled as uh, reformists or modernists. And when you call someone a modernist or reformist, uh, that means just calling man infidel, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so they are marginalized. So what happens is that from an Islamic perspective, what is populism? From which Islamic perspective, unfortunately? So especially these uh, populists, and they are in power, they interpret it from an authoritarian perspective. When they are in opposition, or they say pluralism, voice of the opposition, Rulers, power must be limited, etc. But when they are powerful enough, unfortunately, they are very opportunistic and suddenly they just go back to the books and this time we can choose the authoritarian rules. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And so you are basically um, uh, saying that most of the populist leaders in the Muslim world actually look for uh, this kind of legalistic uh, ways in order and appeal to the people's sentiments, especially emotions, in order to mobilize their power, uh, rather than focusing on something uh, as uh, like good governance principles, for example. Thank you, Prof. Essan. Let's go to um, uh, Dr. Munir. Um, so when we are talking about, um, you know, Islam, uh, populism and democracy, um, so many people will have the questions of how does Islam derives its legitimacy from the authority of God? And therefore, how far can it be placed within populism that has people as the ultimate reference? Are you finished with that? Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, 
uh, this is, uh, as uh, Professor Elmas um, has explained, is uh, is really complicated um, combination: Islam, uh, democracy, and populism. Uh, in some ways, um, uh, there are uh, not in some ways. In fact, in many ways, all of them they overlap each other, and in many other ways that uh, uh, they contradict um, each other. So that's a very uh, uh, dangerous combination if we uh, if we take all them uh, uh, together. In fact, the question of authority and legitimacy uh, in Islam is uh, is uh, uh, at the center of um, Islam and Islamic politics, and uh, uh, this has been uh, historically uh, the reality that uh, this created uh, all the tensions, all the, all the problems throughout uh, Muslim history. Uh, we have seen um, uh, immediately, uh, even during uh, the time of the Prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, uh, there were uh, other uh, false prophets claiming um, uh, legitimacy from God. Uh, so uh, at the center of um, uh, the the issue is um, is um, uh, the the authority, uh, the legitimacy, and uh, the source of legitimacy. As uh, uh, Professor Allah he uh, he claimed as um, uh, it was the case that um, he was getting his um, uh, authority and legitimacy from from Allah. So those false prophets, uh, as rivals, they were also claiming the same. That, uh, they had the same source of authority and uh, therefore they claimed that they were the legitimate uh, leader. So uh, uh, after that, when the Prophet Sallallahu died, then uh, uh, again the question of um, authority and the legitimacy uh, came up and that was the first thing uh, uh, that the Muslim community had to face. Uh, and immediately after that, uh, until all the way uh, about 100 years back, uh, as recent as um, the collapse of um, uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire, that uh, we have seen uh, throughout uh, uh, the history of the Muslim world, uh, everywhere, whether it was Khilafah or it was some dynasties, um, small, small dynasties, and uh, here and there, everywhere, at the center of um, uh, uh, the, the relationship between uh, between um, uh, Islam or Islamic so Muslim society, Islamic law or um, the ruler is all about legitimacy and authority. And uh, uh, so uh, in our time, we face a different reality, a new reality, where uh, the populism, uh, liberalism, democracy, uh, these uh, uh, make our reality even more complicated that uh, if you follow uh, one stream, then uh, if you follow just simple, if you, if you want to follow democracy, then there would be many variants of democracy. If you want to follow liberalism, then there will be many variants of liberalism. As such, uh, 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 it, it makes our, uh, our um, question of um, uh, legitimacy and authority um, and, uh, and uh, uh, the relationship with um, uh, people, uh, and God, those different dimensions is very complicated. Now, coming to the question again, that uh, um, in uh, in Islam, is um, uh, laws basically are supposed to be um, originated in uh, in Allah or God, so that means the legitimacy comes from there. But then, in our time, we live in uh, uh, the time of democracy. We live in time of populism or liberalism, then uh, how can we uh, reconcile between uh, the two? Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Ilmas has, um, uh, has um, explained um, quite nicely of the different um, uh, dimensions of um, this issue. Uh, and I concur or, or with him on, on many points that um, uh, the issue of liberalism can be seen from many different perspectives. That um, it can be seen from people centered, people perspectives, or it can be people people centered, that uh, which depends on people's um, sentiments, people's emotion, and any leader can um, exploit that and um, establish uh, the, his his or her legitimacy uh, of leadership. 
or it can be just leader centered. The leaders come uh, with his or her own image and people get attracted to, to the leaders. And that's how, again, uh, the leader uh, can exploit um, uh, people's um, uh, sentiments, people's emotions attached to the leader uh, or people's uh, support uh, given to the leader. In that way, the leader can establish his or her own legitimacy, referring to the people. Or idea center or ideology center that uh, a leader comes with uh, a, an alternative or a challenging ideology, which become attractive to the people. And as such, uh, the people uh, start to, to start to render support to, to, uh, to that ideology. In that way, uh, the leader itself uh, can uh, derive um, uh, the legitimacy of his authority or, or his um, uh, leadership uh, from the people. So these are all different dimensions of, of um, uh, deriving legitimacy from the people in our time, where uh, uh, when we live in uh, the time of democracy, in the earlier, in the past time, past um, uh, history in, uh, in the Muslim um, civilization of Muslim world, uh, there had been time, I mean, almost all the time uh, until about 100 years back that uh, the Muslim authorities did not need uh, people's legitimacy for their power, for their authority. But now it's a different uh, uh, reality that we live in. So the question of uh, um, uh, the, uh, the Islamic principle of authority, that is um, uh, theoretically laws and the source of authority is Allah, but then uh, 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 in our time, uh, is the people uh, that are considered to be the source or referent uh, for authority. How do we reconcile them? I argue that, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, my opinion would be more on the people side, that um, as soon as, as, soon as um, uh, the, uh, the tradition of prophethood has ended, uh, basically, the, uh, the legitimacy and the leadership issues transferred to the hand of the people, because it's the people uh, uh, that is ultimately given the amana that the Quran uh, talks about, that the amana that, that uh, the prophets were entrusted with. Now, with the end of the prophethood, it, this amana is not transferred to the people. Now, the people how the people carry out this amana, uh, whether it is through, uh, uh, through emotion or uh, through resentment or through um, uh, some other means, uh, and whether this, uh, 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 this mentality or attitudes of the people uh, go along with the, 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 uh, the basic uh, rules, regulations, or the principles, or, or morality uh, of the Quran, or not, like what um, uh, what uh, was uh, Ilmaz referred to as maqasi uh, the Sharia. So, as long as people's sentiment or people's expectations or people's emotions they are aligned with this maqasi the Sharia, and uh, they demand a particular type of leadership, or they endorse a particular type of leadership. Uh, I would argue that that uh, uh, follows the Islamic rules. But then if just following the popular populism that we, that we see in many different parts of the world, uh, which is based on whatever people want that they, are, uh, that they want to see their life or society or economy as, then uh, it may not be just a, uh, uh, just a uh, suitable for uh, the Muslim world because in the Muslim world, if you if you uh, 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 divorce say uh, religion from politics, then this creates another problem of uh, legitimacy. So um, Islam in the Muslim world uh, is a factor for legitimacy, but at the same time, divorcing Islam from from politics in the Muslim world is also a problem for legitimacy. 
So therefore, there has to be a middle ground between the two that um, uh, the leader uh, or the leadership and the people, uh, they have to uh, come to a middle ground where they all compromise with, um, uh, uh, with um, uh, the, uh, the basic understandings of um, uh, the, uh, the Quranic uh, laws, rules and regulations, the Sharia laws, rules and regulations, and taking the Sharia as uh, the, the reference point for both of them. Once they come to this middle ground, that uh, uh, it is the Sharia that guides both of them, only the, uh, at that time that the legitimacy and the leadership and the reference to the people come in congruence uh, uh, with each other. But of course, there is this problem of who is Sharia? Is it, uh, who, who explains the Sharia? Uh, uh, but despite having lots of uh, differences, there is definitely one middle ground, one uh, way of um, coming uh, uh, to a particular uh, brand of Sharia that can uh, be acceptable to a uh, majority of the people. You cannot definitely satisfy each and every individual. Uh, uh, and it, it has ne never been possible even during the Prophet's time. Uh, one person, uh, 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 went to Prophet, uh, uh, sorry, uh, one person went to, uh, yes, uh, Prophet uh, uh, وسلم, to get uh, an opinion on a particular issue and he was not satisfied with the ruling and then he uh, went to Omar uh, to get uh, 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 opinion in the way he wanted. So that means uh, it has not been uh, the case that each and every um, uh, uh, rule of a Sharia satisfied everyone. So as long as the majority concern uh, is satisfied, then um, we can conveniently uh, take that that is a middle ground. So as long as the leaders and the pop, uh, people, they come to this middle ground, I think the question of legitimacy uh, and uh, the authority is um, solved in, um, in our time. Uh, 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 taking uh, the democracy, populism, uh, Islamism, and, and um, Islam uh, of the past in, into our consideration. So I think uh, that way we can somehow uh, reconcile between the different uh, dimensions of opinions and different streams of um, uh, uh, politics and political uh, uh, interpretation of Islam and even democratic way of interpreting Islam or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munir. So basically, Dr. Munir is saying that we have yet to reach the middle ground in which Islam, populism and democracy has yet to reconcile the differences. And until then, we need to work with what the system that we have now. Uh, but of course, we need to further pursue on how to reconcile um, uh, the, the, the current modern political system with the Sharia that is supposed to protect the interests of all, um, uh, as mentioned in Maqasid Sharia. Uh, thank you very much. And Alhamdulillah, Dr. Afdi, basically, he has overcome the technical issues and now he is back with us. Uh, so I will pass the floor to Dr. Afdi. Dr. Afdi, the floor is yours. Dr. Afdi, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, great. Dr. Rabia. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy I, I solved the, the technical issues. I was not hearing anything. I restarted a number of times my computer, but now it works. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I apologize for those technical mistakes. Uh, if we can continue then with Dr. Kauther uh, talking on the issue related to uh, the question, uh, uh, as most of the countries in Muslim world uh, do not belong to democracy, this is... Uh, something which I would say is unfortunate. Uh, currently, except Malaysia, Indonesia, and Tunisia, uh, since there is a scarcity of democracy in the Muslim world, uh, this is a question in itself, we might 
organize another webinar on this issue, why we are lack of democracy. The question is, do populist politics in Muslim countries endanger or support democracy development, especially when we look at it from a historical perspective, from uh, various experiences, as we see populism often challenging democracy, even in uh, liberal democracy, even in concentrated democracy. Uh, and I pass the floor to Dr. Kalferon. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Thank you, Dr. Rabia. And thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> so this is another very complex question, actually. It seems, uh, uh, it, seems straight, it might seem straightforward for some, but it's uh, actually not straightforward at all. Because when reading the question, one might be tempted to see a relation of causal effect between the scarcity of democracy and the nature of populist politics in the said Muslim world. Um, it is more complicated than that, and I must say that uh, it is also partly linked to the second part of my intervention uh, about the impact of colonialism on, uh, on post-colonial uh, politics. Uh, however, uh, I would like to focus on, on, on a few elements first, and, and uh, just like uh, Professor Yilmaz said, uh, um, both democracy and populism are, are moving concepts and, and they differ from a place to another uh, and, and sometimes even from a scholar to uh, another. Um, and there exists an issue uh, with most studies uh, or surveys uh, and this issue is that they usually refer, uh, the, the frame of reference is usually uh, the, the, the Western context in a very normative way. Uh, so we tend to look at democracy and populism in that frame of reference. Um, if we look at it, and very basically for the sake of the, of the argument, uh, uh, if we look at these elements in question, uh, democracy represents basically the, the ultimate legitimacy. Uh, it rests on the concept of rule by the people and, and uh, and according to that concept, uh, no one possesses the ultimate truth. Or uh, uh, so it calls. Uh, it is based on the. Uh, it is based on, on on a principle where where all parties, where all political movements, will live in a kind of toleration. Uh, and whatever the ideas uh, uh, defended uh, by these uh, multiple players uh, on the political uh, spectrum. Uh, democracy is also, rests also on the, the, the basis of a multi-party system, uh, a judiciary system, a free press, and uh, so on. So, uh, uh, however, uh, as we can see, and again, we are uh, uh, returning to this normative uh, uh, frame, uh, uh, and uh, it is believed that that uh, once democracy is consolidated, meaning that it has uh, lasted for uh, quite some time uh, in a successful, relatively successful way with meaning a stable democratic culture, economic stability, and so on, there is a slim possibility for major assaults on it. Um, however, uh, if we look at populism as being an intrinsic part of, of the political exercise, uh, the last statement uh, shows it, its limits, both on the theoretical level and on the practical level. Uh, populism being based on uh, the belief that uh, they, the populists, are the true representative of people, we have a discourse that will uh, uh, evolve around we or I represent the people and it's well. The system should answer to us, me, uh, the people uh, uh, need to take control over institutions, even those institutions created to protect the people and the political processes. These are uh, uh, discourses that we have seen uh, uh, not only, uh, not only in, in the Muslim world or the so-called Muslim world, but we have seen this uh, development in Brazil, Hungary, Turkey, uh, uh, and, and, even, uh, and even to some extent uh, in, uh, Western, uh, in Western democracies, such as uh, France, uh, for instance. Um, 
However, uh, one has to bear in mind that the word populism refers to, uh, as we said, and as, as uh, highlighted by Professor Yilmaz and by uh, Professor Munir uh, Zaman, uh, to a contested concept. And it is often misleading and it has different meanings in different contexts. Um, however, populism has a common, possesses a common core. Uh, this common core does not need similar context to develop. This core builds around two main elements. The first element uh, that does not constitute a populism on its own is the anti-elitism, uh, the identification that there is a problem with the political uh, and uh, or the economical elites. And as I said, it's not sufficient uh, uh, and it cannot constitute populism itself. The second very important thing is the anti pluralism that makes populism, uh, the rejection that others can represent the people, uh, the refusal to accept other players, and those are very present elements in the discourse, for instance, of uh, many, if not uh, 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 all uh, Islamist parties. Uh, this calls for a, a, a few reflections and a, re a slight reformulation of the question and to answer the question, one may say that it depends on the type of populism and on the ideology that constitutes the political basis of the state populism. Uh, as uh, highlighted before, uh, populism usually needs a, a strong ideology, it rests on a strong ideology. Um, and uh, thus it also depends on, uh, as I said, the democratic ideal and on the definition of the people, the famous we, the, the, the uh, is that we uh, inclusive or exclusive? Uh, and when we talk about Muslim countries, we actually mean Muslim majority countries. And uh, uh, usually the so-called, uh, uh, and usually when we refer to them, we, um, uh, when the people that is referred to in this context is usually or almost always Muslim, which uh, uh, introduces an exclusive uh, element here in the equation. So, um, however, however, when we look at, at the reality, the so-called Muslim world is not homogenous in terms of history, experience, colonial or even non-colonial uh, uh, past uh, and present. And this gives rise to different experiences and different populist movements too. Although, as we said, they all share a common and although Islamist populism uh, shares also many common features. However, uh, in some of these countries, you also have a combination of populisms. Uh, for instance, uh, we have seen the recent events in, in Tunisia, where we have uh, 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 or cultural populism and the president that took over uh, the executive powers recently, uh, who uh, is more of an uh, anti-establishment, uh, who relies more on anti-establishment uh, populism. Um, again, other experiences, for instance, in Lebanon, uh, Lebanon, uh, most people forget that Lebanon is also major, uh, has also majority Muslims, uh, and, uh, but since it is, uh, its political system is based on confessionalism, uh, the populism that arise in uh, Lebanon will be different. Uh, uh, even Islamist populisms in Lebanon will be different from uh, other Islamist populisms uh, in the rest of the Muslim uh, and Arab world. Um, so the experience in Lebanon will not be the same as the Malaysian experience, the Egyptian experience, or the Tunisian one. Um, uh, and uh, now to the second part of the question and the historical background uh, that, is, uh, that is referred to here. Um, the um, populism first appeared, uh, well, we know that it appeared uh, in the late uh, 19th century in, in, in uh, the United States and, and in Russia. Uh, but it all appeared in uh, the so-called Muslim world, uh, and it appeared uh, as part of the pan-Islamist anti-colonial movement in the early 20th century. 
trajectory, and we can see we could see it uh, in the uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, in Egypt, for instance, or uh, in other parts of the uh, Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, developed a discourse followed by actions against the colonial power and local elites uh, uh, that were, according to them, uh, complicit of the colonial uh, powers. Um, they also developed a discourse in favor of Islamic-based values and uh, a return to history. A return to history through the making of Islamic teaching, uh, teachings a prevalent element. Now this is very important because we have this in most um, in most Islamist uh, populisms. Uh, the idea not not uh, expressed uh, per se like this, but the idea of a return to history. Oh, I have one. Okay, uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so uh, let me move on to, to another example, a well-known example is uh, the Egyptian example uh, in the 1950s and 1960s uh, with Jamal Abdel Nasser and the Pan-Arab trend uh, uh, and, uh, and Jamal Abdel Nasser uh, developed, for instance, a populism that was based uh, on, uh, on the anti-colonialist uh, sentiment uh, present uh, in Egypt and uh, mixed with, uh, uh, with sentiments against the corrupt elites once again. Um, and, uh, and of course the Palestine question. Um, so this, uh, for instance, uh, this uh, kind of populism under Jamal Abdel Nasser, for instance, uh, enabled uh, Egypt to get out of the situation uh, get out of a situation where, where authoritarianism and, and extreme economic liberalism was the norm into, uh, uh, into a situation of more representativity for the people. So, so uh, basically some populisms in history have allowed more representativity for the people. However, this does not mean this does not mean that they will not, in the future, uh, threaten uh, the democratic system and uh, 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 at all. So, uh, and, and this has been the experience, actually. If you look at it, uh, we have populist movements that emerged, that raised to power uh, through uh, populist, uh, we have uh, through populist discourses. Uh, then once in power, the experience uh, was, uh, was quite different uh, with the rise of these populist movements and the uprising that took place in the early uh, 2010s in the Arab region, the Islamist parties saw uh, the opportunity to use the institutions to their advantage. Basically, uh, um, uh, respecting the rules, the, the constitution, uh, trying to change them whenever possible, but trying to stay uh, within the lines, but neglecting or re even rejecting the spirit of the law itself. So we follow the law, but we reject or we neglect uh, the spirit of the law. Um, so um, I will finish here because apparently I, I, um, uh, I talked too, for too long. Um, and I'm sorry, I could not finish my whole uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kaufer. Uh, uh, it seems like the uh, uh, amorphousness of the very nature of populism uh, is also reflected into the various contexts within the uh, Muslim world. Uh, which I find is very, very enlightening, uh, since uh, this issue is also present even in, in, in consolidated democracy. The same impact, uh, I mean, the, the, the various impact is going to have populism on democratic developments is also found within the world, uh, which is very much related to the lack of democracy as a result of the experience with colonialism and post-colonial politics as well. Um, 
here also I would like to add uh, what I found out from the conversation with Dr. Kalfa, the issue of uh, the need for pluralism and how then the populism uh, mixed with Islamic, uh, Islamist parties might somehow might bring into, or might endanger somehow the issue of uh, pluralism very much need and very much uh, required to reflect the heterogeneity and the complexity within the Muslim world of areas various uh, dividing lines. Uh, if I may uh, continue to the next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Hasnan Bakhtia, on the issue of uh, related to the question of uh, how populists demarcate. One of the fundamental elements of populism is one of the core elements is a reference to the people. Although although they differ in various contexts of what they mean by the people. So the issue is that as populists usually demarcate the people along ethnic, national, social, and other lines, even religious lines, probably. How about the demarcation in the Muslim world? Is it done on a religious basis? If yes, how far can it be justified on religious grounds? As this demarcation often might lead discrimination, and then how one can justify discrimination on religious uh, ground. i pass the floor to Mr. Hasan. Thank you, Dr. Afti. <laughs> uh, I think let's uh, focusing on the uh, reality of the political contestation and it's clear so-called the uh, real politic. And when we come back to uh, Niccolo uh, Machiavelli, a political philosopher who underlines the importance of the uh, classical realism, something that has happened regarding the process of uh, real politic is not different thing. Uh, I think it's not far from reality and uh, Machiavellian political realism. And it's true that individuals, thoughts, inclinations and political behavior have been influenced by their environment or their uh, context of life. In the context of uh, Muslim life, the influence of religion is very important. And the big issue that we often deal with is, uh, uh, does Muslim that really wanna have a power, a struggle for his or her religious mission um, in order to serve religion, gaining power to serve religion or otherwise uh, just want to grab uh, the power and therefore one can um, uh, realistically uh, using religion as an instrument of uh, politics. Uh, I'd like to share a uh, little bit what has happened in my country, Indonesia, especially uh, the last two decades of uh, the post-political uh, reformation since uh, 1998. The first is the moment of a uh, gubernatorial election in Jakarta in uh, 2017. And the second is the presiden uh, presidential uh, election in uh, uh, 2019. And I think both are examples that indeed don't represent majority political process in the Islamic world. This is very specific. And in the first moment when Basuki Cahaya Purnama or famously called Aho, an incumbent governor of uh, Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia that uh, substituted uh, Jokowi, the former uh, governor who was uh, appointed as the president of the Republic, Aho ran for governor again and his uh, opponents um, had used, uh, according to my personal opinion, uh, uh, various campaigns as well as uh, the negative and even black campaigns that uh, had been established uh, using a very conservative uh, religious claims and arguments. Why? It's because Aha is a politician believing in Christianity 
and ethnically he is also Chinese. So he is in the context of this real politic is minority and even double minority. And what's more is uh, that the in in one of his uh, campaigns he uh, stated that please um, don't want to be lied or manipulated by the Quran Surah Al Maidah. It's about the warning to avoid choosing a kafir or infidel as a leader. But the word by or in bahasa is jangan mau, jangan mau dipohongi, jangan mau dipohongi surat al maidah oleh surat al maidah, pakai surat al maidah, pakai. But the word by is pakai. In this episode is uh, highly controversial. Many understand that the word by means using the Quran, using as a tool. It's because uh, Bahasa Indonesia as uh, 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 Bahasa Melayu has a high level of uh, ambiguity. Uh, it uh, really depends on the functionality. Um, in short, what the Ahok suggests actually, please don't let us just trust people who using or manipulating the Quranic words as a political instrument. So according to the political perspective of the opponents, what Ahok said is a kind of uh, insult and humiliation. Then it is not it is not difficult for them to say that Ahok, a man who is Chinese and non-Muslim and therefore kafir, as a blasphemer. Moreover, Majelis Ulama Indonesia, the state-based fatwa maker organization, um, released uh, the fatma mentioning that it is haram or strongly forbidden to choose a kafir as a leader. So consequently, uh, the populist movement among Muslims had emerged. I'm sorry, I'm not sure with the term Islamic populism because Islam, I think, must uh, consist of the defined uh, filters that are non-manipulative. And, and perhaps uh, the term Islamist uh, populism or Muslim populism is more suitable with the reality happens. Uh, some analysts such as um, uh, Fedi Hadis argues that the mass that had involved in the political demonstration uh, demanding to imprison Ahok, that is about the people expression due to uh, the government performance, the poor performance. So it seems there is no justice, there is no welfare and so on and so forth. And uh, Professor Fedi adds that this all had happened through the complex process due to the systemic political game played by oligarchies. So he put oligarchism as a key agencies that had been conditioning the situation. And more specific thing, uh, specific things have been uh, uh, by an Indonesianist and a professor at the Australian National University, uh, Marcus Mitzner. I quote, um, there is no guarantee that the country's democracy um, will survive uh, the next 15 years if its parties remain financially um, unsustainable. So it means that the parties had been offered dependent um, uh, to the conglomerates, the bosses, anyone who have uh, money. And this is the reality that has happened until today. And Tempo, a national magazine with high reputation states that populism that had emerged will potentially transform itself to become more democracy. So it had uh, uh, threatened the development and practice of uh, Pancasila democracy um, Indonesian style of uh, democracy, which emphasizes the wise and major uh, 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 deliberation. Uh, we recognize it as um, in, in Bahasa Indonesia and um, Beli. And therefore, I think discrimination is not a big problem for them who instrumentalize religion to solve uh, certain political pragmatism. This instrumentalization had been applied by some political parties to win the election, although in the end they were defeated. And the mass that fought against Ahok, they support 
uh, Prabowo. And it is interesting because when Jokowi uh, became a president, Prabowo, um, he was offered a position and then appointed as a minister of uh, defense. If, you know, the, the, the answer that you want to hear is that Islamist uh, populism is a good thing. The largest and moderate Muslim organizations in Indonesia, uh, Muhammadiyah and Nahdlatul Ulama, they insist to argue that the best uh, political strategy in Islam is democracy. And furthermore, the best democracy for them is Pancasila style. And it's obviously, you know, uh, uh, very uh, prescriptive. It's a prescription. And although still important to be discussed. Thank you, Dr. Rafdi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, very enlightening contribution. You have raised here a number of very important points, uh, such as uh, the case of, one would say, what is Machiavelli uh, doing within the, among the Muslims, among the uh, Islamic parties? <laughs> is there a place, uh, or should there be a place for Machiavelli there? Or is it religious really to pursue the uh, Machiavelli understanding, instrumental uh, understanding of religion as you say that it's a very useful tool, especially to deal with people, not to be religious, but to pretend to be religious because people want to see, to see the politicians that they really are, are religious, although they, are, they, they shouldn't actually be according to Machiavelli understanding of religion. And this is probably unfortunately to find among among the communities which refer to God and refer to religion. You have raised an example of Indonesia of how religion is being instrumentalized for political purposes. And then how religion is impacting politics, especially also through the demarcation of believers and non-believers. But at the end of the day, then also politics impacts religion. In turn, uh, as uh, as uh, it is probably promoting a sort of uh, polarization in the society and discrimination, probably and so on, which is not really easily justifiable. If one refers to God, if one refers to transcendental, then discrimination should not have a place. Uh, another important point, which was raised by uh, Mr was that the issue of the content. So we should avoid using this Islamic populism. It cannot really be easily defined rather than using Islamists or Muslim currently uh, populism as they are using democracy. But even they see democracy in a very instrumental way, not as a platform where the pluralism can really be uh, developed and can really be uh, sustained, but as to come to power, then once gaining power, then probably just uh, endangering the democracy itself. And we can move to the next presenter, to Dr. Shaza. Uh, Dr. Shaza, the question to you is related to the very concept of populism and how it interacts with other ideologies, since it in itself as an ideology might not be sufficient provide an answer to a number of issues. So according to Kasmude, one of the leading scholars on populism, populism is considered as a thin standard ideology, waiting for other ideologies, uh, other thicker ideologies probably to flirt and to interact with. And therefore, we find populism from left to right as it interacts with various ideologies. Um, how far is political Islam in some democracies or quasi democracies in the Muslim world interacting with populism, using populism as a strategy, as a tool for gaining and maintaining power? Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Um, the question is a bit more straightforward, I think, for myself. Um, and I. I mean, all the other panelists have already elaborated on what populism is, 
so I may not have to go back to that. Um, so I'll just go straight to the to the question about um, this idea that populism is a thin ideology. What it means is just like I think Prof. Filmas and I mean others have already mentioned that it's very difficult to define um, populism. For me, it's more of an approach or a strategy. It doesn't really have um, an ideology in the sense that what comes next, right? So they, it talks about how to get into power, but then it doesn't really clarify what would the, the, the government uh, looks like. So that makes it a, a thin uh, ideology. And thus, when we combine that with political Islam, then we can see how powerful political Islam uh, can be in, in, within uh, Muslim societies, um, how powerful populism is as a, a strategy um, when it's infused with, with, with Islamism. So political Islam is, is, is you know, it's basically about wanting to put Islam at the center of politics. We are all aware of that. Um, and having quote unquote Islam leading the way, like, like Prof. Uh, Yilmaz already mentioned, what kind of Islam are we talking about? There are so many versions of it sociologically. Um, so it's not a straightforward Islamism plus populism. Uh, that's what we're saying today. It all depends on the relationship between the elites and the masses, because that's basically what separates populism from simple uh, no, party politics competition, right? Um, so what I'm saying is that if the Islamists claim to, 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 to um, claim to represent the people, the masses, then it's pretty obvious that um, it's a thick ideology that is attached uh, to populism, but it doesn't necessarily happen like that all the time. Um, so what we have now is what is called cultural populism. I think uh, Dr. Kautar already talked about it a bit. Uh, it's not really anti-establishment. I mean, when I, I say we, I mean in the, in the Muslim context that we're discussing today, um, it's not really anti-establishment. Some may be uh, socioeconomic populism, but most of the time we're talking about cultural populism. Uh, in which, you know, the, the Muslims or the Islamists, I would say, because Islamists are, are not equal to Muslims, right? Um, not all Muslims are Islamists. Um, so the thing is that these Islamists uh, claim to be the true representative of the people. And who are the others? Because that's what populism is about, right? Us versus them. The others would be the non-Islamists. Um, Muslims that don't subscribe to Islamism, um, generally they're talking about non-Muslims or liberal Muslims that you know don't subscribe to that ideology. Um, then this cultural populism that we're seeing today um, is the kind of Islamist populism, not Islamic populism as, as mentioned uh, by Mr. Asnan and Prof. Ilmaz, uh, that we're, we're seeing today. So when we look at example, because uh, Dr. Abdi asked about, you know, how, how, how this is reflected in, in democracies today, um, before we go to democracies, maybe we can also look at, Dr. Kalsa already mentioned about the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a very good example, right? Uh, a social movement representing the people against who? Against the corrupt elites, against the imperial uh, power. Um, very clear populist movement, but they don't operate in a democratic uh, system, obviously, in the early 20th century. Um, similarly, <clears throat> the Iranian revolution uh, in the 70s uh, was also uh, has been regarded as uh, an event of, of a populist movement led by, obviously, this, this Islamists, this clerics, right? Um, so we can see that it has been successful. That's what uh, I want to get at, that adding on uh, Islamism as the thick ideology to populism has worked, maybe not so much uh, in, in Egypt, but definitely uh, in Iran, right? This populist um, Islamist claim that they're representing the average Iranians against the corrupt Shah, who's obviously supported by foreign powers, 
So this is the us versus them. Again, the, the Muslims, the people, the average people uh, should be heard. And there they succeed. Um, so is Islamism, for me, becomes uh, a shorthand. It's, it's, it's a way for people to recognize what is going on, right? Populism is just, like I said, it's just a strategy, an approach um, to get the people uh, to be mobilized in a sense, but you need to get the people excited. How, and you need to get the people to recognize what these movements are representing. So when we say, okay, Islam is populism, it becomes clear, aha, uh -huh, these are the people that, that supposedly um, representing my interests, my being Muslims. Um, so in this way, we can really understand why it is so easy uh, for Islamist populism to come up, um, using Islam to justify their approach, to justify their strategy, to justify the demonization of the others. It's easy. It's easy to understand. It becomes basically palatable to the people um, that, oh, okay, so this is, not, this is not something negative to the average masses. This is, we're talking about Islam. And again, quote unquote Islam. Um, and if we look at recent times uh, and we look at uh, democracies, quasi democracies, like um, Dr. Avdi asked uh, in the question, we can see. Muslim populists uh, coming up in the past 20 years. Most research talks about President Erdogan of Turkey, uh, President Joko Widodo of Indonesia as being uh, examples of Muslim populists um, in the Muslim world. But it's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not certain. I think I, I, I've, I've mentioned that since the beginning. It's not certain because even Erdogan's version of, of President Erdogan's version of, of uh, Islamist or cultural populism only came about in the past 10 years, post-2011. It was not there initially in the early 2000s. Uh, similarly, like uh, Mr. Hasnan has mentioned with uh, President um, Joko Widodo, President Jokowi, it only came about since 2017 and like he mentioned it was it became very obvious uh, in 2019 um, all the the things that he did um, to win that election by using this populist uh, approach so it depends on the mood at the time it depends on what the people want and with this rise of uncertainty with globalization and migration and uh, the instability of modernization Identity comes up, right, uh, in the past 10 years or so, 20 years, the issue of identity. So these populist leaders take advantage of that for their own um, benefit. I just, I just mentioned those two, uh, President Erdogan and President uh, Jokowi, but because we have Prof. Yilmaz and Mr. Asnan, I think maybe I, I, I could shift my focus and talk more about Malaysia. Um, so in Malaysia, when we talk about Islamist populists, it's, it's, it's quite new. Um, because the thing about Malaysia is that when we talk about populism, it has different, different, different kinds of populism. You know, people talk about how the Pakatan Harapan government was also a populist government, but it's more of a, in a socio-economic nature. Um, similarly, Barisan National also, through their many, um, their many, ways to, to, to get the people support, for example, with BRIM previously, these have all been, uh, been supposed to be a, a populist uh, strategy. But focusing more on Islamist populism, we can obviously look at uh, PAS, right? Uh, PAS is an Islamist party in Malaysia. Uh, that's pretty obvious. But my question is, how much of a populist are they? Can, can, can we say PAS has always been a populist party? I would argue that not necessarily. Uh, I would argue that PAS uh, was not a populist party previously because of its more regional character, um, you know, support being in, in the north of the country. Um, and also the fact that PAS actually worked with uh, different elites uh, in history. Because remember, pop, the thing about populists is that 
they view the others as illegitimate, uh, not worth their time. They can't even govern the country because they're not the real uh, representative of the people. But PAS has shown their willingness to work with different parties, different elites. So they're not a populist. So this previously. So this again support what I was saying earlier that it depends on the context, it depends on the time, on the mood of the people. Um, but all of this changed uh, in the 80s uh, when um, Hadi Awan came up with his Amanat Haji Hadi uh, in 88 and you know talking about how uh, the AMNO, the party that was ruling the country for 60 years, was, uh, and they were infidels, they're, they're kafirs. So we see here now, aha, a populist rhetoric come up, delegitimizing AMNO, saying that they are infidels. We're not supposed to um, support them, therefore. So we see it came up in the 80s, but then it, it, it went down in the 90s, but then we saw it coming up again, and this became very, very obvious um, since Pakatan Harapan became uh, the government in 2018. Um, my, my argument is that, you know, this is their opportunity, this is their chance. All of this time that they've talked about um, Malays being under threat, Muslims being under threat in Malaysia, and in a way, this is quote-unquote proven when Pakatan Harapan came to power with, with uh, the DAP, the Chinese space, well, mostly Chinese uh, based uh, party, as part of government, they can quote unquote proof to the people. See, this is what happened. Um, this is what happened when you um, you don't vote us Muslims, Islamists, uh, into power, and they use so many. There were so many rhetoric, so many things that maybe I will mention uh, in the second round. So many things that they did and said to show to the people that look, we are being threatened, Muslims are being threatened, and uh, I, I can't remember, was it Dr. Dr. Kautar or Prof. Ilmas who, who talks about it, about, you know, the, the urgency. When we talk about populism, they're talking about there's a crisis that we need to fix now. We can't hold on to this. We can't wait for, I think, Prof. Ilmas, I, I can't remember. We can't wait for parliamentary sitting for this, uh, to fix this. We, the people, have to solve this now. Um, so PAS became a very populist party uh, in the past two, three years, and it worked. The thing is, all of their efforts together with, with the other two parties, Malay-based parties, actually worked to bring down the government. But um, I think someone also mentioned about how, you know, populist rhetoric changes whether they're in opposition or whether they're in government. It's the same thing with PAS. When they were in opposition, wow, it's so many talks about we're under threat, we need to fix this, we need to fix our Sharia law, yada, yada, yada. But when they were in, in, in government, suddenly we don't really see all of this. So the, my point is, it's all rhetoric. This is populism 101. Um, it's, it's not really about the things that they're talking about. It's more about getting into power and staying into power. I think I'll end there first. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaza, uh, for your presentation. Uh, you have highlighted some very important uh, issues on the way of how uh, politics is um, as an ideology, how it interacts with populism, how it uses uh, populism as a since, according to Dr. Shaza, more strategy of uh, gaining power, power rather than being able to give an answer to the problems after they, they really gain, gain the power. And uh, uh, as uh, political Islam or, or, or Islam is probably might have that as providing a bigger ideology compared to, to populism, and that this varies from the context to context. Uh, how this interaction plays and what might be the impact of politics also at the society level and back to, towards democracy and democratization. 
Dr. Shaza also highlighted the content of cultural populism very much present in the Muslim world. Um, uh, mostly uh, identified through Islamists, demarcating between Islamists and non-Islamists, including non-Islamists, those who are um, much more liberal or not Islamist or, or anyone else which is not Islamist, probably. Uh, this is also known as uh, Islamist populism. Uh, it provided an example of Iranian revolution, of how they made use of religion as a way of legitimizing religion and the politics and so on. Uh, although this might be discussed on this uh, uh, issue of uh, how far this can be really uh, uh, legitimized from the religious perspective, if we just avoid politics for a while. Uh, uh, another example, which was a clear example in the case of Malaysia, is a political party. Uh, it seems to be a much more clear example uh, of the party, often populism through rhetoric as a way of mobilizing, uh, using religion as a way of mobilizing uh, voters and uh, supporters. Another issue which was very important was the issue of identity. As today, uh, everyone around the world is talking about identity, and this is a good opportunity also for Islamists to step in and to, to make use of uh, identity issues and uh, then uh, provide a sort of, a, sort of identity based on, based on the Islamist perspective. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Uh, now uh, we can uh, move the second round of presentations. We move to uh, Associate Professor Dr. Munir, and uh, we will continue on the issue of uh, left and right scale. Uh, uh, in the uh, number of uh, populist cases around the world, uh, we have seen populism present from left to right, and this is related to the way how it interacts with other ideologies. Uh, since populism in different contexts around the world is found, is found from left to right scale, how about populism in Muslim world? Can it still be framed within the left-right, uh, left-right scale? Does it really uh, mean, does it really have a meaning to see uh, within this heterogeneity, within the Muslim it's still be seen within the left and right scale. Uh, the floor is to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Abdi. Uh, yes, um, all over the world, um, the, the trend has been that um, uh, populism has different variants and uh, have uh, moved from uh, uh, the spectrum of left and right. Uh, and that is, I believe, also has been the case in the Muslim world, that um, uh, populism in the Muslim world has had many different, um, uh, uh, many different um, uh, color as well as um, origin. In the past, uh, well, basically populism in the Muslim world uh, appeared uh, uh, to me uh, from 1950s onward when the Muslim world uh, started to get um, uh, uh, independence from the colonial past. Uh, so uh, during that time, 1950s, 60s, uh, populism in the Muslim world was very much um, uh, influenced by two factors um, simultaneously, I would say. One was uh, a nationalism or ethno-nationalism factor. The other was um, uh, the leftist uh, ideology factor. If you look at, um, for example, uh, the case of Egypt, uh, referred to uh, uh, by some other uh, speakers here, Jamal Abdel Nasser, and, uh, uh, he, he, he was a populist um, uh, leader, but uh, also in many ways and uh, a very authoritarian type of leader. But then his uh, populism at that time uh, was uh, very much influenced by by uh, uh, the Arab nationalism, 
as well as uh, uh, the Baathist uh, um, Arab uh, uh, ideology, uh, which has a uh, leftist um, leaning. And that uh, uh, ran across um, uh, the Muslim world. Uh, I mean, not the Muslim world, I mean the Arab world, uh, from Egypt to, to Iraq. Uh, later on, Saddam Hussein picked up and then uh, uh, also um, it was the case in, um, in Syria under uh, Hafiz al-Assad. Uh, um, and then uh, it went beyond, but with a, a, a little bit different um, uh, uh, variant um, in uh, Libya, where Muammar al-Gaddafi picked up uh, this, uh, uh, this Arab nationalism, uh, Baptist nationalism, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a mixture of um, uh, Islamism, Arabism, uh, then uh, uh, leftist or socialism. So during 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, we found a large chunk of the Muslim world had uh, this uh, populist um, uh, ideology uh, with uh, leftist and nationalist um, uh, um, uh, tone uh, uh, mixed um, uh, in that. Other parts of the Muslim world, like um, in the Indian subcontinental part, where uh, I can refer to Bangladesh, where uh, the populism was very much um, uh, uh, influenced by ethno-nationalism, uh, which um, split uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, in the case of uh, Iran in 1950s, 60s and uh, 70s, uh, it was a different type, which uh, Dr. Shahzad referred to, that uh, it was not um, uh, nationalism as such, or uh, uh, but it was more on on uh, influenced by uh, uh, the the religious um, uh, 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 side of um, of um, of um, uh, say uh, populism or religious side of politics. But at the same time, in Iran, uh, the the leftist um, um, ideology was also very strong, but. Um, uh, uh, it, it could not compete uh, eventually with uh, the Islamic um, ideology. Uh, uh, eventually the Islamic revolution happened. And um, uh, so uh, there are uh, basically during 1950s, 60s, 70s, we found uh, uh, this uh, Islamic uh, uh, ethno-nationalist and uh, the leftist uh, type of um, uh, ideologies influencing uh, the populist uh, or populism or populist uh, movement in those countries. But after 1980s onward, uh, uh, the leftist uh, uh, ideology or leftist orientation has uh, declined, uh, obviously because of the uh, uh, decline of um, uh, the, the leftist ideology or leftist uh, regime in, uh, uh, in um, uh, the Soviet, earlier Soviet Union, uh, which uh, earlier until 1970s influenced uh, all the leftist movement around the world, especially in the Muslim world. So from 1980s onward, uh, the, the, the trend has been uh, shifting from left to right. That 1990s and the following two decades, we found in the Muslim world the populism has been uh, trying to reconcile with, um, uh, with uh, 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 more liberal democracy and uh, even, uh, even Islam. That uh, during the past uh, few decades, the, the uh, Islamists, or if you say Islamist or uh, Muslim political parties uh, have uh, uh, become much prominent in politics in all the Muslim countries in different, uh, 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 different guys. So uh, the, the populism in the Muslim countries had to go more towards the right in the spectrum uh, to reconcile with, uh, with uh, uh, the rise of Islam or, with the, uh, or to uh, uh, compromise or come in line with uh, uh, the sentiments of um, the majority of um, the Muslim population. So in that way, we found um, uh, in uh, Tunisia or in uh, Egypt, uh, there had been uh, uh, much tension a decade ago, uh, but then uh, at the center of this tension was um, uh, to what extent we can compromise between uh, Islam and democracy, between uh, Islam and secularism. 
So it's no longer it's a leftism or uh, left or leftist ideology, but it is uh, um, uh, the compromise um, uh, on the elements all on the right sides, um, Islam, or liberalism or secularism, uh, but to what extent that could be a compromise between uh, the, uh, the three. Uh, I think uh, over the past uh, uh, 70 years, uh, populism in the Muslim world has shifted completely from the left uh, to the right uh, spectrum uh, of politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Munir. Uh, thanks a lot for your contribution. You have raised a uh, very important issue here, uh, whereby aside from uh, Islamist ideology, uh, we see other ideologies uh, interacting with politics in the Muslim world, uh, very much present in those years, uh, moving, taking uh, populism to be found from left to right across the Muslim world, uh, interacting aside from uh, Islamist ideology, which seems to have taken ground much more recently. Uh, there was nationalism, including the nationalism. And Arabic as ideologies uh, that impact the populism, uh, aside from leftist ideologies, much more influenced from the socialist camp, uh, with the recent uh, influence of uh, rightist ideology, liberalism, and also with uh, Islamist uh, political parties. So based on this, we can see that in the Muslim world as well, we can identify uh, in various countries from left to right. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Monir. We move to uh, Dr. Shaza uh, on the issue of uh, uh, how the populism is considered uh, based uh, to most of the scholars, Laclaus have a bit of a different uh, approach. He considers populism, he evaluates populism in a positive sense as according to mobilizes citizens in democracy, uses uh, mobilization, politicizing the issues, and integrating further citizens in politics, which is one of the aims of democracies to uh, increase the inclusion. In this type of citizens' uh, mobilization taking place in Muslim world through Islamic politics, is Islamic politics mobilizing citizens in this world, in this populist, uh, populist uh, way? Uh, is it used to empower further citizens as they, in, as they are further integrated, much more participating in decision making? Or is it used to polarize society? through the marketing of people in very puritanic religious grounds. Glory is to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Avdi. Um, right, so it's true, uh, since as we've discussed already that populism goes through multiple um, phases uh, in, in history. Um, back in the early, and not early, in the middle 20th century, you know, populism uh, it's a means um, to get people to participate in politics, especially when we talk about Latin America. Um, so in a sense, it's, it's, it's a good thing, right? Because when we talk about democracy, like Dr. Tavdi mentioned, uh, we're talking about uh, participation and representation, and that is what we want. Um, so if populist leaders or populist movements could somehow bring the people uh, into the political process, then we should support that, we should love that, right? Uh, however, the big however is that uh, from being this uh, inclusive, the inclusive nature of, of populism, unfortunately, what we have now is this very exclusive uh, nature of populism. Instead of saying, okay, we disagree with the elites, therefore we, the people, should now take charge um, uh, over governance, what they're saying today is the elites are altogether illegitimate. Get out. We the people should get in. So this is the problem today. It becomes uh, exclusive. 
rather than inclusive. So unfortunately, populism, and even when we talk about uh, the Muslim world, it has this very negative uh, connotation. And it's not very difficult for us to understand why. Um, like a few of us have already mentioned about the idea of, of um, you know, what we have today is, is cultural populism, meaning that the us versus them is based on culture, based on ethnicity, based on identity. It's much more difficult to find a middle ground. Um, and what we have now, I mean, not just in the Muslim world, in, in, in Western Europe, in, in America, ethno-nationalism, right? Um, based on, on, on an ethnicity, based on an identity that they believe represent the real people, the true people. What about the others? The others, uh, basically, they don't deserve to... Um, they don't deserve to, 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 not just to be in the country, but to experience the economic prosperity that they do right now. Who are these others? You know, we talk about uh, if in Western Europe, they're talking about immigrants. Um, the others would be Middle Eastern, North African immigrants uh, in those places. In the Muslim world, in Muslim majority countries, um, the others would be those of different ethnicities. Uh, the Chinese, usually it's the Chinese. Um, and I mentioned the, 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 the liberal Muslim because the liberal Muslim represents this cosmopolitan uh, Muslims that uh, are different from the, 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 the masses, from the Islamists, the people that the Islamists claim to represent. So when we talk about, let's just take the Chinese uh, as the others, how do you find a middle ground? Um, between us and them, between Muslims and non-Muslim, between um, indigenous people and, 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 and the Chinese. Therefore, it becomes uh, very polarizing. So my argument is that whatever um, good things that uh, populism brings, because again, we, we can't deny that if populism acts to mobilize the people, then that's, that's a good thing, right? We should get more people uh, to get involved. But the problem is, Unfortunately, these people that, that, that are mobilized, they don't understand, nor do they truly respect the norms and values of democracy. I think a few people have mentioned both Dr. Avdi and I think Dr. Marie Zaman mentioned about, you know, democracy is about, yes, um, majority will come into power, but you have to also respect the rights of others. You need to protect others. But these new people, the thing is, these new people that the populists mobilize, they don't see the others as, um, as important to be part of the equation. Um, therefore, whatever, like I said, whatever the good thing that populists brings, the negative will bring us this net effect of, of greater um, polarization. Um, for example, let's say in 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 a uh, Muslim democracy and Islam, Muslim country, if they say that only Muslims are supposed to rule that country, it's supposed to be the president or the prime minister, whatever it is, then you're effectively saying sorry to the others. Uh, you will never reach this point. You will never be able to reach the apexes in in in, in government. So again, it becomes clear that uh, populism has this very um, polarizing, unfortunately, very polarizing effect uh, in, in Muslim society, Muslim uh, democracies, um, because you can't find uh, the, the shared values, which is what democracy is about. You, you're supposed to find the shared values among uh, various factions. Uh, so again, if you guys... Uh, uh, allow me, I will use Malaysia again as an example, though I, I can use like Turkey and Indonesia as an example, but we have the experts here, so, uh, so let's just talk about Malaysia. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, in PAS, on top of PAS, uh, currently we have Bersatu and AMNO, all are Malay-based uh, parties. And you know in Malaysia, Malay equals Islam. And these three main parties, Although they've changed leadership here and there, it's basically the same government, the same Malay-based parties that are ruling right now in Malaysia since March 2020. Um, they have really 
amp up their uh, rhetoric on, on, on Islam. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, especially during the 22 months of the Pakatan Harapan administration, there are so many examples that I can mention, but due to time, maybe I can just mention a few. Um, the, 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 the biggest examples, such as the Buy Muslim First uh, campaign, you know, prioritizing uh, Muslim um, products first. Not necessarily bad, but again, when the idea is us versus them, then where do you find uh, the middle ground? Uh, the politicization of the Jawi calligraphy issue, um, and obviously the the um, uh, the 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 protests against the ratification of of, of ICED, uh, right? The, the the National Convention on Elimination of All Racial Discrimination. So all of these things were really played up in the in the twenty two months, um, and they were played as an existential threat to Malay Muslims in Malaysia. Uh, again, remember, that is what populists do. They're, they're talking about, this is about survival. It's not just about differences in political ideology. Differences in political ideology is, is, is basic in any kind of uh, system or regime. But they're talking about, this is about our survival. If we don't fix this, well, I don't know, we're gonna be, um, we're not gonna be here in Malaysia. Or some of them even said, you know, the Pakatan Harapan government will sell Malaysia. I don't know where or how they're going to sell Malaysia. But again, it's all of this rhetoric about is our um, survivability uh, within the country. Um, but to any observers, uh, we can see that, um, you know, Malays are the majority in the country. Malays are the majority in, in, in Malaysia. And the Malay-based government has actually been in power for 60 years. Um, so this fear uh, of, of, of being ruled by, by non-Muslim, by non-Malays, for me anyway, it's, it's funny uh, because the number's not there. Um, the Malays has always um, been well represented. Uh, but like a few of the panelists have already uh, mentioned, populists, they don't look at facts. Uh, this is the thing about populists. They don't look at facts. They don't look at scientific evidence. For populists, what is most important is the common will of the people. That's it. If the people believes it, then it is true. They, um, populists, they celebrate ordinariness. For them, ordinariness is the key because if a lot of people, on ordinary people, believe that, agree that, then it has to be true. So you can throw out all of your scientific argument with them. It doesn't matter. So like I said to us, we can say it's, it's, it's funny. How can Malays be under threat? Uh, but that's what they're, they're, the fire that they're playing with. So in this situation then, um, trust within society deteriorates. And obviously this is not good in a multi-ethnic country like Malaysia because if you don't have trust among the different people then basically there goes your your um, the fabric of your society right so populism unfortunately has become this this vehicle for this uh, polarization in in um, the country and like I mentioned earlier unfortunately their 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 attempt their, their populist rhetoric actually worked because of all of this um pressures i guess on the pakatan harapan government as we know you know uh besatu left that government because they felt under pressure of this what is this pressure this pressure of the malays don't see them as representing the malays anymore the pressure is so intense that besatu left the pressure was so intense that the pakatan harapan government in fact um, um participated in the Malay Dignity Congress, if uh, all of you remember a few years ago, again, to show that, wait, wait, wait a second, we are also, we also represent the Malays, even though we have uh, the AP as part of our coalition, you guys should not be worried, but it, it didn't work, it didn't matter, all of that is history, uh, we now are back with, with uh, Malay-based uh, government uh, in power. So I will just end with this. Um, 
if we talk about majoritarian democracy, and this is what most populists do, they talk about, um, you know, if 60% of the people believes in it, then that's democracy, right? We talk about democracy is, is what the majority wants. But that is actually majoritarian democracy. It's not what liberal democracy would look like, right? Uh, liberal democracy would also, um, we don't delegitimize the others. We don't say they are outsiders. They don't deserve to be in government and things like that. So this is what um, Muslim populists, uh, I guess, would do. Um, and I think, uh, it becomes very obvious. I mean, people would say, okay, Dr. Shaza, what's, what's your, your evidence for, for saying all of this? Look, when they use religious symbolism and religious rhetoric on national TV, you know, when, when they, they, they praise God and whatnot on religious TV, good, sure, good. As Muslim, we, we say that's good. But when you do that, who are you playing that with? You're obviously trying to get the support of one faction within society, the Malay Muslims, where you claim to be a leader of all, but the things that you do kind of shows that uh, I just want to get the support of this one group. So like I said, this is majoritarian democracy. It's not what liberal democracy should be about. And yeah, um, unfortunately, that's what populists are do, polarizing society. Um, I'll end there. Thank you, Daudi. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, It seems like uh, populism would really have a positive effect in democracy if it integrates without polarizing. If it really uh, opens the door to have much more people on board on decision-making process to different mechanisms, but then the net uh, negative effect would uh, uh, politicizes the issues in the way that it actually divides, it uh, polarizes society based on uh, the various uh, privileges, ethnic or religious or other privileges. Providing also the example here in the case of Malaysia with this uh, by Muslim first uh, campaign and some other examples of uh, political. Uh, uh, as well. So based on this, we could say that uh, yes, in one side it really politicizes issues and increases the influence of people in politics. But probably in the case of Muslim world, it increases the interest much more towards uh, dividing and polarizing of who belongs to the people and who is not the people. By people, not meaning human being, but who is considered. The of the right to the Muslim world must be dominated by, by religion uh, demarcation, or at least referring to religion as they demarcate using religious as a very religion as a very, very useful tool to legitimize whatever the actions. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Shaza. We move to Mr. Bakhtiar. Uh, I pass the floor to Mr. Bakhtiar. The concept of UMA has been propagated by Muslim leaders as a means to create a Muslim identity that transcends the geographical borders. However, do you think the concept of UMA has been used to mobilize populist politics, especially from conservative religious groups, perhaps in the case of Indonesia? I pass the floor to you, Mr. Bakhtiar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Afi. As we discussed before, it happened, you know. Uh, Uma is more symbol as a significant role to encourage the mobilization of the uh, populist uh, politics. And we know uh, that they, uh, populists, were defeated as a strategy. Uh, Islamist uh, populism that has been uh, supported by the conservative mass seems uh, to be not effective to fight against the pro-democracy uh, and uh, moderate religious voters. Uh, when Aho lost and um, then convict uh, for uh, violating the blasphemy law, at the same time, 
uh, the government um, uh, ban uh, Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia (HTI), a popular uh, political player that uh, joined in the uh, carriage of uh, Islamist populism in the real political uh, contestation. Uh, the government reason is that um, HTI or HTI is Butahrir Indonesia aims to uh, establish um, an Islamic uh, state with a caliphate uh, system as a system of uh, governance. Uh, besides, uh, HTI thinks that Pancasila um, 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 uh, is the state principles that are pro uh, Western democracy. So uh, Pancasila is kafir. And Indonesia is categorized as the state of war or Darul Harbi and needs to be overtaken. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, be taken over. Uh, it's uh, uh, really uh, 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 dangerous and subversive according to the uh, government's perspective. Thus, there is no way but HTI or HTI must be banned. However, I think um, the HTI ban is because they are aggressive and provocative uh, to burn, to strongly encouraging uh, the spirit of our populism among Muslims. So it really disturbs the Jokowi's uh, maneuver, political maneuver in the uh, contestation against uh, Prabowo. And because the supporters of uh, Jokowi understand that their opponents use the strategy of uh, instrumentalization of religion, one of the conservative uh, figures and also an intellectual actor at making MUI, MUI fatwa, uh, quote unquote, forbidding Muslims to choose a kafir as uh, their leader, Kiai Haji Ma'ruf Ma Amin. Anyway, his actual background is NU, Nahdlatul Lama, the moderate one, but it seems the conservative wing of NU. Ma'ruf Amin had been offered as a candidate of the vice president together with uh, Jokowi. What next after Ma'ruf Amin joined uh, with Jokowi? Furthermore, as I mentioned before, Prabowo was appointed as a minister of defense. Now, some conservative uh, figures were disappointed and then they had met at the moment of istima ulama the meeting among ulamas they relatively agree with utopian ideals of uh, hti hti which insists to establish the islamic state accommodate uh, the caliphate system and implement a sharia as a legal system in the state formally and from the meeting it uh, had result the idea of NKRI bersariah or Indonesian, but uh, bersariah. It means uh, they will accept Pancasila in Indonesia, but must be transformed into the nuance of Sharia, Islamic law. From this part, I want to argue that when the forum of Istima Ulama is institutionalized, it will have a possibility to become a political party. And if uh, the forum Istima Ulama transforms uh, itself to become a party, they will have an opportunity to involve in the next uh, political contestation. Uh, they also will have uh, representatives at the uh, parliamentary halls, um, um, uh, Gedung DPR. Um, um, if getting at least 4% uh, of the national voters uh, it's about the uh, parliamentary threshold, yeah, they will uh, uh, be successful. So like or dislike, uh, they have to affirm the system of uh, formal democracy. It seems to be more realistic. Let's see uh, whether they are really utopian and their ideas will be supported by the people in the process of election or not, you know. And, but I'm sure that they will not uh, be a winner of the contestation. Why? Because Indonesia is Muslim majority country, yes. And UN Muhammadiyah are the largest Muslim organizations within the country. 
and both are pro-democracy and the process of uh, substantive uh, democratization. And NO has a, a doctrine of loving the country is a part of Iman. Uh, it's such a, the religious creed, who bulwaton amin al Iman. And Muhammadiyah thinks that Indonesia is the state of consensus, as consensus among the people of the country. And the state of witness, it's about the engagement uh, and involvement with the process of the development of the state and country. It's so-called Darul Ahdi wa Shahada. Uh, although some analysts uh, has claimed that and when uh, to fail to protect democracy in the country, in fact, both are the winners. And we know today, and despite uh, the fact that uh, they have not uh, fought directly in the real political contestation, the high um, politics that they have played, especially uh, forging um, the political literacy in the grassroots level, seem to be effective uh, to protect the integration of the state and nation. So uh, I think if there is a question, does political Islam led to Islamic populism in the context of Indonesia? Obviously, no, does not. The realist political parties do. One of the intellectual actors of Islamist populism, his name is uh, Amin Rais, Professor Amin Rais, um, 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 alumnus of uh, the University of Chicago. Actually, his background is Muhammadiyah, but maybe uh, from the pragmatist wing, he just established the party Ummah. So does Islamic populism lead to democratization? One skin? No, does not. I think in the context of Indonesia, no, does not. They seem to be an obstacle of the process of substantial or substantive democratization and uh, Islamist populism is therefore ineffective strategy of a real politics. But this is very specific case that uh, we had faced. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdi. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ba uh, thank you, Mr. Bakhtia, uh, for the presentation on the, uh, highlighting the case of Indonesia, how, to what extent is the concept whom I use in a populist way and it back in politics. We move to Dr. Kautha on the issue of uh, populist ideologies tend to glorify the common man and advocate supremacy of the masses over the elite and call for the revival of traditional values, defying foreign economic, political, and cultural domination. Do you think the rise of populism in the Muslim world is a consequence of social history of marked by violent uh, dispossessions, exploitation, and impoverishment rooted in the common? The floor is to you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Um, thank you for this question because I, I believe that it's a very important question, especially that. Uh, whenever uh, we read uh, studies or whenever there are studies that are uh, conducted uh, about populism and democracy, especially in the, the ex-colonized countries, um, uh, uh, not many are taking into uh, account the, uh, the particular context. And um, um, colonialism, for instance, um, is not often uh, referred to as a possible uh, factor for the rise of uh, populism. Um, especially, especially, especially uh, nowadays when, uh, when independences have been reached, uh, achieved, and, uh, and it seems that uh, colonialism is uh, a thing from the past. Um, I would start by saying that if you believe that populism is another form uh, or another performative political expression, or it is intrinsic to politics, then populism appears. Uh, then, then if populism appears, or, or then the appearance of populism is uh, quite a likely occurrence. Uh, this does not mean, however, that there can't be factors for its emergence. 
and uh, as it usually emerges uh, when it is needed to consolidate uh, society or a part of it facing uh, uh, some uh, identified uh, threat. The recent uh, history or the current history, the recent resurgence of political populism everywhere uh, in the world shows this uh, in a very striking way. The most prevalent form nowadays uh, of populism is, uh, is a right-wing populism cultural or religious one based on exclusion. We find these, again, I am uh, citing Brazil, uh, but uh, uh, U the US, um, uh, recently uh, Poland, uh, very much, and, and in Poland uh, it has uh, reached uh, some um, uh, quite high extent of uh, um, of institutional um, disruption, uh, Hungary, India, obviously, and uh, and you can find it too in France with the whole discourse, the anti-Islam uh, uh, discourse, uh, and and the, the pro-financial institutions also discourse that you can find uh, uh, among uh, the political, the current political elite, or the especially the members of uh, La République en Marche, which is uh, the president's. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, party. Um, so this uh, resurgence of populism, uh, uh, especially right-wing populism, is opposed, uh, obviously, as uh, to, to a populism that was more based on anti-establishment or, or socio-economic populism, and that we find more prevalent in the left spectrum, and mainly in South and Central America, for instance. I mean, these are uh, quite good examples, but you kind of do in, in uh, the African uh, continent um, uh, too. So uh, this resurgence is, is due to, the, to, to many factors. The impact of globalization, uh, the change in the nature of labor, thus in the economical and social structures, uh, also the change in the political system uh, with multi or two party systems. Um, so, so here are, I mean, the, the main factors. But then again, historically speaking, one can contend that in context where people were, uh, people, the, the people, the, the, the frame of reference people, uh, was actually referring to the colonizers, the complicit elites, the settlers, etc. Then the native people, not being represented, consulted. Uh, etc. is in search for representation, in search of a voice, and in search of power over their own destiny. Thus, political movements uh, at that time, especially uh, uh, during um, independence uh, wars uh, and uh, after, uh, after uh, the, the ex-colonies have reached their independence, um, the political movements have had a fertile ground to build on and populism develops as it is needed for the rise of nationalism, national identity, uh, solidarity, and to envision a common destiny. So uh, at that point, uh, populism emerges almost as a natural feature uh, of post-colonial uh, uh, politics. Uh, populism starts then to threaten the national fabric, and if they get, if they rise to power, uh, populist uh, movements um, uh, the, the, they might uh, um, use or, or the institutions and 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 uh, of course um, um, how to say this. Uh, uh, use uh, the element of representativity or uh, uh, and so on. So colonialism, if we look back, colonialism has created conditions that call for very different trajectories compared to non-colonized countries. Uh, for instance, there is no, there cannot be an, a universal or unique model of democracy uh, post-colonialism. Uh, uh, colonialism created institutional, economical, political contexts that are to be found only in ex-colonies, that the colonizers 
have uh, no knowledge, uh, no 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 um, no experience with. They have to. Uh, they have had uh, the ex colonies, uh, and I'm moving and I'm talking about ex colonies. I mean, the question was about Muslim um, countries, uh, but uh, Muslim most Muslim countries were colonies, uh, and uh, we can see many similarities between uh, uh, the the. Muslim countries, uh, the reaction of the Muslim countries, the emergence of populism in the Muslim countries, and other ex uh, colonies. Um, so uh, they, uh, these ex colonies have had to create institutions and processes, uh, or they were expected to create institutions and processes similar to those in the Western democracies without benefiting from the same conditions at all. Now, uh, now, of course, some will ask, okay, populism was a needed tool during the independence wars and post-independence, but what about now? I mean, colonialism is a fact uh, from the past. And again, the answer would be that colonial powers have been succeeded uh, by international institutions, global policies, economy, uh, 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 and, and economy discriminates, um, discriminating against what they consider uh, failed states or transitioning or developing countries. So just like uh, uh, the uh, League of Nations uh, was succeeded by the United Nations um, and uh, the United Nations is a prevalent international institution nowadays, but still it is the successor of, uh, uh, of, an, of an international institution uh, that uh, uh, was uh, the, the uh, responsible for, for the mandates for the uh, for the partition of the Ottoman Empire, um, for the partition of, of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, so on. Um, okay, apparently I seem to exceed my time all the time. Um, so the the, the ex colonized are still subjected to policies inherited from the colonial past, especially when it comes to economy with the pressures of international institutions. Um, many of you may be familiar with, with the, the, how, how, the, the, um, how the international financial institutions are exercising pressure on, on, uh, on uh, ex-colonized countries, especially when they are trying to borrow money uh, for certain projects, and then the international institutions uh, actually tell them where they have to invest that said money. So they are not even, so these ex-colonized uh, countries are not even uh, uh, able to decide which sectors of its economy they can uh, develop. In that uh, context, the ex-colonized don't feel represented, and the demands of normative models uh, create a stretch or a paradox. Uh, uh, in, 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 their, uh, in their societies. Economic apartheid is prevalent on, on a global and national level, which gives birth to a politics of performance. Um, and also uh, something else that we have to note is that when it comes to the Muslim world, as it is itself facing anti-Islam populism, it often reacts with an identitarian or, or a populism, with a religious uh, uh, populism, uh, adopting the language of the us versus them, the Muslim world versus the West, uh, in a similar fashion as Orientalism can create a mirror reaction such as Occidentalism. Uh, so in, in short, um, uh, of course, the colonial past and present, uh, we can see that there is a colonial present, of course, it has uh, evolved and it does not um, uh, it does not express itself in the same uh, uh, with the same tools or in the same way, but uh, uh, but colonialism, uh, exploitation, dispossession, uh, the, the and all these phenomena that that are really rooted in the colonial past have and have influenced and continue to influence the emergence and the development of uh, populist discourses, populist movements. Uh, in uh, the ex uh, uh, colonies and uh, and for our purpose here in uh, the Muslim world um, in, in uh, a fourth story. So thank you very much.
Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Kothar, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we see that uh, colonial experience and even post-colonial settlements uh, can be counted uh, as powerful factors impacting population in the Muslim world. Uh, we move now to Professor Ilmas. Uh, can there be a link between populism in Muslim world and religious extremism and radicalism, especially through rhetoric of political leaders manifested through emotional speeches, tears, crying in front of masses, and so on? And if so, uh, how should Muslim society respond to that? The floor is to you, Professor Mas. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, radicals, Islamist radicalists, jihadists, etc. They don't need populism uh, to be radical. Uh, even without populism, they are radicals uh, anyway. And throughout centuries, we've seen many people who claim to be acting on behalf of Allah or in the name of Allah and doing terrible things. And they were not really referring to populism or acting in, in the name of the people. Because they're already uh, doing things in the name of Allah. So they don't need the people. Uh, but on the other hand, populist rhetoric and populist narratives uh, in the long run may have support radicalism. And may it, it, is, a, it is like a conveyor belt. So it is not as radical as jihadism or Islamist, whatever, but uh, this conveyor belt, they, it can take people in the mainstream, center, uh, left of center, right of center, and then travel them towards radicalization. Why? Because as explained before by other speakers, uh, I also tried to talk about it a little bit. Populism is about identity politics. So generally in the Muslim world context, it is about religious identity. And this religious identity, unfortunately, uh, rests upon the fact that it is constructed vis-a-vis -vis the other. Most identities are formed like that, but in the Muslim case, in the Islamist case, it is a little bit more radical. So here, instead of dealing with yourself, with your own identity, defining who you are, what you are, your attributes, it is much more focused on the other, the enemy, the conspiring antagonists here. So we are unfortunately led to believe that the world is comp composed of bin binaries, mannequin binaries, that are diametrically uh, in opposition to each other. So there are no gray or hazy areas. It is all black and white. It is, you are either with us or with them. I should say that this is not just limited to Islam or Islamic, Islamist populism, of course. All populisms, especially right-wing populism, I like that. If you look at India and Modi, he is exactly doing the same thing, but not using Islam, in this case, Hinduism. Trump was, to a certain extent, was doing the same thing, but not with Hinduism or Islam, Christianity. So at the end of the day, they use and abuse religion for these purposes. In the Muslim world, because the majorities are Muslims, it is more useful to uh, use Islam for these purposes. So they antagonize others, and they say that these are our enemies. Until they become Muslims like us, then they are suspicious. So we should either assimilate them or we should, by using force, simply make them obey our rule. Uh, this is what's been going on. And of course, this is not something about democracy. If you look at Quran, it is not even, I wouldn't, from my own perspective, I wouldn't even call it Islamic because if you look at Quran, it talks about fighting war, warring uh, non-Muslims. It is about their animosity towards Muslims and they want to, they don't want to have peace. They want to kill Muslims, etc. That's why um, Islam talks about polarization. Islam talks about 
animosity, etc. But normally, the peace is essential in Islam. And Quran talks about Ahlul Bayt. Quran talks about the prophets of other religions in a peaceful uh, manner. Uh, Muslims are allowed to marry non-Muslims, etc. Uh, but unfortunately, in the politics of Islamism, these issues are sidelined and we are left alone with just binary oppositions. And this is also coupled with the fact that Muslims have been humiliated for centuries. And, and again, this is in the political arena. And it wasn't about Islam and Christianity winning over Islam, etc. Bible fighting with Quran and then Bible wins over. No, Muslim empires, they became weaker for a variety of reasons. And then they started losing the battles. Previously, they were winning them. Now they are losing them. Previously, there was an expansion and Muslims simply went and occupied the territories of non-Muslims. And now it is changing because non-Muslims are more powerful uh, with technology, etc. And this brought a humiliation. And with the especially rise of the West, this humiliation became deeper and deeper. And colonialism that we talked about here, it made it worse. And it is, of course, legitimate to crit criticize the West, its expansion, its illegitimate unethical practices, its colonialism, etc. And we must do it every day. And actually, many Western intellectuals have been doing this for a few centuries. There is nothing wrong in that. But what Muslims or Islamist populists are not doing is that there is not a self-realization. There is not a self-perception, self-criticism. So it is always blaming the other. So, but if you look at Islam, Jihad Akbar is the one that you simply criticize your own self, which is between your two shoulders, yes? Uh, this is what the prophet said, but this is not done, unfortunately. So there is not the Jihad Akbar, the ma major um, Jihad that you should always with Muhasaba accountability of yourself. And you don't see this in, in, in Muslim, with Muslim politicians, especially Islamist politicians. So it is always the fault of the West. They did this, they did that, and they've been occupying and conspiring, and et cetera, against Western powers. So when there is no criticism and there is no rational and scientific analysis of what went wrong with the Muslim world or with Turkey or Indonesia, why we were occupied, et cetera, because there must be some internal reasons as well some domestic reasons. It's not just fault of others all the time. This is childish. This is very immature. It doesn't work like that. So all this rhetoric, unfortunately, uh, irrationalizes individuals if they, of course, are, in the, uh, are under the influence of the Islamist rulers. But some, unfortunately, sometimes these Islamist populists, they are very charismatic. They talk about Islam. And sometimes they are very religious. And this is a very fresh air for many Muslims who have lived with secular rulers, who westernizing rulers, who were antagonistic towards Islamic practices, headscarf, prayers, etc. So when you see a Muslim leader, especially a powerful leader surrounded by armies and soldiers and bodyguards, etc., and if he recites Quran very nicely, then suddenly he becomes the perfect person in Sani Kamil. But is he? Is he corrupt? There is a, a study by two American Muslim scholars, Islamicity Index. And these scholars looked at 400 different parameters based on Quran and Sunnah, such as accountability, transparency, honesty, human rights, uh, mercifulness, affectionate, uh, cleanliness, etc. all these things. And according to this index, uh, Iceland, Sweden, etc. they are the most Islamic countries. The best in the Muslim world is Malaysia, but I think it is the, the 40th. And others, Iran 170 and Turkey 110, Saudi Arabia 180, etc. And there are not thousands of countries. There are just about 200. So according to Islamic criteria, 
Muslim majority nations are not really Islamic nations. But there is no self-criticism. And you always talk about the enemies, others, conspiracy theories. So you are playing with the emotions. And this, of course, makes people angrier, especially the youth. And it, of course, radicalizes people. And I think the major reason why this happens is that it is rooted in Islamic uh, jurisprudence. I will go back to my previous point here. Uh, and concepts such as darura, for instance, et darura to be al mahdurat. So necessity makes the unlawful, illegitimate, lawful. Normally, this is what is necessity. Normally, this is about survival of an individual. If you are in a desert, dying out of starvation, okay, then you are allowed to eat pork. That's it. But unfortunately, Muslim scholars over centuries, they have expanded this concept and they generalized it. So everybody uses darura. So if a Muslim politician is under difficulty, he just tells a lie. He says, this is not haram because it is a necessity. I am saving my nation here. I'm saving Islam here. I'm doing this for Allah. So corruption, okay, I am stealing, but there are these secular enemies. They are attacking our headscarf. They are not building enough mosques. So I'm stealing this so that I will be powerful so that I won't lose the elections. I'm doing this for Allah. So you can justify anything. So unfortunately, in the eyes of the Islamists, Islamic ethics, it doesn't ex exist. As uh, Audi said, it is just Machiavellism. Uh, you can just opportunistically uh, interpret any Islamic rule for your own benefit, unfortunately. There, there is no fundamental anymore. There is no ethical criterion anymore because there is darurat and you are allowed to do this. You can uh, oppress the opposition. You can silence the media. You can fight against the minorities. Why? Because there is an existential problem. Your people are attacked. Your religion is attacked. So this is what's been going on. So emotions are there. So what's the solution? I don't think there is a solution because humanity has been like this for millions of years. And we've been actually <laughs> sort of animals survival and, and there is a survival issue is simply just kill others. This is what humans are, unfortunately, when they are not limited by ethics, religion, and moral philosophy, etc. So this is what's been going on. And education is not always solution because if you look at Western democracies with educated populations, populism is a problem there as well. Because here we are talking about emotions. And if you talk to marketing specialists and economists, behavioral economists, they will tell you how to play with people's emotions by using different colors, different musics, et cetera. So under these instances, doesn't matter if you have a PhD in nuclear energy or you are an astrophysicist, et cetera, you suddenly turn into an animal. And populists have been using this by polarizing people, by using these emotions, by using your resentments, by using your uh, vindictiveness uh, and, and, and your humiliations. I'm talking about the collective humiliation, collective traumas here. So yes, education is of course needed, but this is a test, it's an imtahan. So this is an ongoing battle. So there is no easy and fixed solution for this. So, and democracy is not just a fixed thing, a status that you earn it like a PhD, then until you die, you are a doctor, no. When you have a democracy, you have to cherish and nourish and protect it every day. It's like a marriage. So you are married, okay, everything is done. No, your wife can leave you anytime if you are a stupid husband, if you don't do your work, etc. So you should be careful every day. So democracy is like this, it is very fragile and populists can take, uh, can take advantage of popular, uh, pro, uh, po democracy's weaknesses because there is a freedom of speech. You can speak your mind. You can talk about emotions. You can criticize whoever you want, etc. So it is a very uh, perfect environment for populism and radicalism 
uh, to grow. So every day, these issues need to be discussed. And self-criticism, unfortunately, is uh, one of the missing gems in the Muslim world. It is very rare, unfortunately, self-criticism. And it has to be taught even in primary schools. Saying sorry, saying that you must be also at fault. Not always the others, not your friend, yeah, not your enemies, not, not, not the West. Uh, so also an objective evaluation of the West. Yes, the West has done many mistakes in Afghanistan. They are doing new mistakes, etc. But if you look at objectively Muslim empires, they were not composed of angels, Muslim nation states, Muslim rulers. We've done all made, uh, similar mistakes. Uh, many Muslim majority nations, if you look at them now, they are 90% Muslim, 85% Muslim, 99% Muslim. Only 100 years ago, they were only 50% Muslim. What happened to them? Terrible things happened in many parts of the Muslim world. So it's not just only the American Indians who were massacred and subjected to the genocide, etc. So we should be objective on these issues and self-critical. I think this could be one of the solutions. It is a long-term battle, unfortunately, and there are no easy fixes, as I said. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Eriksson, uh, for your presentation. If I may just add a small point here on the relation to the Islamicity Index, then based on this, probably we need to, aside from Muslim world, we need to have somewhere an Islamic world. So additional, additional Islamic world, which is not much present in the Muslim world, is it? Based on this index. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think due to the time, we need to skip question and answers. If you allow me to conclude uh, the main findings that we have learned from panelists uh, today, I hope this webinar will be a step uh, forwards uh, on this issue of uh, populism, Islam, and democracy, uh, considerably studied. And I hope this will be encouraging for further studies especially to deepen the research on uh, main points that were highlighted here by the uh, panelists. It was uh, presented that uh, populism is very much present in the Muslim world in various ways, in various contexts, uh, found from left to right, mostly influenced by uh, Islamists, and it was uh, very wisely pointed out that uh, we should be careful on the concept, not to use Islamic populism, as there is no such thing, but to use an Islamist uh, populism of how populism as a thin uh, central ideology interacts with uh, Islamist ideology, uh, who are very much having this uh, Machiavellist approach towards religion. Uh, very much increasing the demand for populism among the Muslims, but then in turn supplying mostly symbols of religion, not really the uh, content, not really the substance of religion, which is very much based on ethics. And uh, also it was said that from the factors that count uh, of the presence of populism in the Muslim world is also the colonial past and on the uh, settlements and experiences of, of uh, Muslims across the Muslim, Muslim world through highlighting a number of cases in a number of uh, various contexts within the Muslim, uh, Muslim world. It was also said that um, populism in the Muslim world doesn't seem to be much healthy for the development of democracy as it might uh, raises the interest of people to participate in politics, but politics, but then it um, politicizes the issue towards dividing, towards demarcating between Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, and then seeing things into black and white, and also endangering somehow the pluralism, which is the very essence of 
of democracy. And based on this, we can also add that uh, uh, the current uh, populist answer within the uh, attempts to democratize a number of the Muslim world, like uh, the Arab Spring, for example, uh, populism might be seen as losing the chance, losing the historical chance for democracy based in the, in the Arab world, since populism, it was said that it's not an answer. Yes, populism is a good strategy to come to power, but once you are in power, really you are not able to provide a solution uh, to the issues which are at stake for the society and people. Uh, by this, by those conclusion, I would like to thank all the panelists, uh, Professor Ilmaz, uh, Dr. Monir Zaman, uh, Dr. Shaza, Dr. Kauthar, and Mr. Bakhtiar for a very fruitful contribution and very insightful discussions on the issue of uh, populism, Islam, populism, and democracy, how populism is used as a platform mediate between the uh, not easily relationship between Islam and democracy, just uh, making probably uh, compromising, com compromising the very coexistence which uh, supposedly is, is doable and, and, and is needed by, by the Muslims around the world. By this, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Sister Aisha, Aina. Yes. Okay, thank you to all. Thank you very much to all our panelists today, Mr. Hassan Bakhtia, Prof, uh, Professor Isan Yumas, Dr. Monir Zaman, Dr. Shaza Farhana, and also Dr. Kauta Gwedri. So before we end this session, maybe all of us can turn on the camera and smile to capture some of the pictures. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. So we hope all of our audience have had a meaningful discussion today and let's end our event today with the recitation of Tabit, Tasfiq, Kalfarah, and Surah Al-As. Okay, thank you to everyone. Have a nice day.